All right, welcome to John Boyd Book Club. Really excited to get this project going today and to begin talking about the work of John Boyd. This is something that I care about deeply and have cared about for many, many years. It's informed so much of my thinking, both in and out of my fire service career. It guides so much of how I lead and parent and teach. I can't begin to describe how impactful Colonel John Boyd's work has been on my life. With that in mind, I want to take a second and just thank everybody who is a Patreon supporter. Um, it, it's what's allowing me to do these videos. The reality is even just um, with the start of this project, um, myself and Sean as part of the Adult Academy Fire Service Warrior project have invested pretty significantly in technology to be able to do these screencasts and develop this in a, a really we hope exciting and interesting way. So with that said, we are going to kick off Boyd Book Club today. Episode one, I don't know how, what I'm gonna, how I'm going to number these things, but we're going to call it episode one of the Boyd Book Club. Today, we are going to focus on a couple of different things. We're going to focus on a couple of things. We're going to talk about Boyd's work broadly in Boyd Book Club, but we're also going to talk about specific texts. Today, we're going to start with dealing with Ozinga's Science, Strategy, and War. At some point, we're going to get into Coram's biography. We're going to talk about Grant Hammond's The Mind of War. We're going to get into Boyd's original source material, his aerial attack study, his only written paper, Destruction and Creation, which is an incredibly interesting and fascinating book, and then the, the sort of his magnum opus, for lack of a better term, a discourse on winning and losing that forms the foundation for so much of what we talk about about Boyd when we go forward from there. So this Boyd Book Club project is something that I don't know that I ever really considered doing as a project before sort of the, the modern age of social media um, and the technology that we have. It's something that I think I've always wanted to do, both in the, the fire service warrior space as well as in the other educational spaces that I work. And ultimately, Boyd's theories, Boyd's philosophy, Boyd's thinking has really, again, been something that has been close to me for the better part of 15 years. We're pushing 20 years since I first was introduced to the work of John Boyd. The first book that introduced me to John Boyd's thinking was Paul Howe's Leadership and Training for the Fight. It's a good book. It's an interesting book. And Paul is, in his book, is doing his own after-action review of his time in Mogadishu during the Black Hawk Down incident in 1993. Paul was an operator on the ground with um, Delta Force, and his book is his after action review of not only the major Black Hawk Down incident, but the other operations that they went on, the lessons learned. And he talks a lot about Boyd's concepts, particularly the OODA loop concept that is so familiar to many of us. And that, that OODA loop concept became the starting point, the jumping off point for me in considering and finding out about Boyd. I then began to apply Boyd's work in my first book, The Combat Position. Any of you who have read it have seen that I also tackle Boyd as a, um, as a tactician, I suppose, first and foremost, as a person thinking about the tactical application of an observe, orient, decide, act cycle in a highly iterative, highly tempo-driven environment. I only briefly touch on sort of the deeper implications of OODA loop theory. And, and pretty simply, I think that's because the combat position was published in 2011. My thinking has continued to mature significantly since then, thankfully. And I think that what we see in Fighting Fire from 2014 brings an even larger understanding of that picture. So Boyd is somebody who has fascinated me for many years. The, the truth of the matter is conversations that I've had with folks who knew and worked with Boyd, like Chet Richards and Chuck Spinney, drove me to undertake going back to finish a degree. Um, it's why my degree concentrated in psychology and philosophy, why I studied evolutionary biology, why I have 
actively tried to understand sh social thinking, human order, chaos theory, systems thinking, all of these things. I hope to bring all of that knowledge to this project and to the works that we study in particular each session, each week, however, however this goes down. So this week, we are starting with Science, Strategy, and War by Franz Ozinga. This book was originally written as part of Ozinga's academic work. It, was tw it is his doctoral dissertation published by Rutledge in book form. And when you read the book, I think it's important to look at it in the light of it being an academic text and the work of a, a, an Air Force officer genuinely interested in Boyd's work and his theories, but undertaking it as an academic. Understanding that academic project is important because it helps to understand how the book is structured, why it's structured the way it is. Ozinga makes it clear right from the beginning of chapter one slash the introduction that we're going to talk about today that this book aims to provide a better understanding of the strategic thought developed by John Boyd. That is Ozinga's entire start. It is his entire course. It is what he is looking to speak about. And he uses many different mechanisms to illuminate and expand on Boyd's thinking. In Ozinga's introduction, which forms chapter one of the book, he is setting out his project. He is giving us an understanding of who Boyd is, why Boyd came to think the way he did. He identifies some of the key problems that people have with understanding Boyd's work, some of the key criticisms, and points to where these critics may have fallen short. This is a very common structure to academic work. And again, this is an academic text. It's important to recognize it and read it as such. This book reads differently than some of the other books that we're going to read about Boyd. But I think it's a great starting point. It's a great starting point because it is a challenging book. It is a book that is going to challenge us to read closely and critically in the way Boyd read the material that helped guide him along his thinking. And by ordering our thinking in this academic way, it's going to help us delve more deeply, more critically into not only the secondary literature, mine included, that we're going to discuss, but also when we begin critically looking at Boyd's work itself. So when I say that we're going to be looking at source material, source material is what in classic academic ease would be considered primary sources. Primary sources are those bits of research, writing, creation that come from the topic matter at hand. Boyd's work is in itself a sort of secondary source. Boyd is synthesizing so much learning that he was doing, but also pulling in his own experiences in informing it. Early on in the book, Ozinga gives us that picture. He gives us that picture of Boyd's path from the, uh, his early stages in the Air Force, flying fighters, flying F-86s over Korea, all the way through his career in the Air Force, culminating as an unpaid consultant for the Department of Defense. And in that way, I think we can consider Boyd's observations, primary sources. We certainly can consider works like the Aerial Attack Study, a primary source. This is a published piece of literature. His energy maneuverability theories are certainly primary source literature. They have been published by the US Department of Defense going through a peer review process of their own to determine that they make sense as canon, as doctrine. However, we also need, in the study of Boyd, to consider Boyd's own works as primary sources. So the principal source material that we'll use to reference back to, to talk about when we explore Boyd's work in particular, not only in the context of discussing Ozinga, but as we get into the other authors that we're going to talk about, is going to be the Air Force University's 
2018 publication of A Discourse on Winning and Losing. This was edited by Grant Hammond. It's released by the Air Force University, and it is available as a free download from the Air Force University. The links to download that are in the description of this video. So you can either download it directly from the Patreon page, or you can go ahead and download it via the Air Force University directly. Um, you'll notice my note at the bottom. I've only just recently begun going through the Hammond collection. Um, my original source material, the sources that I have used in my study, are facsimiles of Boyd's original slide decks. And those copies of slide decks came from internet sources that are no longer maintained. Because of that, and because of wanting you as a reader, as a participant, as a, uh, an interlocutor, as somebody who's going to discuss this with me and with one another, I think we need to have a primary source text that we can all agree upon, that we can all find solid material on. So we're going to use the Hammond Discourse on Winning and Losing. Because within this, we see the key briefings and paper that Boyd wrote. Patterns of Conflict is Boyd's first presentation. And within the source material here, you're going to see a link to a set of videos that um, pair the slides with some archival footage of Boyd speaking. It's not my favorite playlist. However, it is a good one. Um, I don't like the way the audio turned out on some of it. And I'm going to provide links in the description of this video to other playlists that you might want to use. But the nice thing about following along with the discourse of win on winning and losing and using the QR code reader that is, or the QR codes that are embedded in the slides is that it will take you through the material piece by piece by piece, and we get to hear Boyd himself discussing his ideas. Next point. What are you referring to here? What we call quotes. Patterns of successful operations. What I'm referring to here is we're going to be in a competitive or conflict or adversarial relationship here. What are those kinds of things that we can do to gain leverage or action? When I first started studying Boyd, those things didn't exist. They hadn't come out of the archival holes and VHS tapes had not been discovered. The wealth of information of Boyd speaking for himself that's on YouTube now is indescribable. And I highly recommend you spend the time listening to it. So the first one that we're going to look at then as we get into the source material, and the first one that we will see Ozinga write about with a lot of detail is going to be patterns of conflict. Patterns of conflict sets the stage for everything that is going to come after it. Now, there is a paper in here, Destruction and Creation. Destruction and Creation is the only truly written work, the only true publishable, though not published, paper that Boyd wrote. And I really think it is a place to begin, though I will say it is dense, it is deep, and it's something that we'll probably tackle two or three different times over the course of months and do some really close readings on. But if you give Destruction and Creation a quick read and then go to Patterns of Conflict, I think what you're going to find is a clear understanding of where some of Boyd's thinking comes from. Boyd's work then flows from patterns of conflict into organic design for command and control, from there into strategic game of question and question. Boyd answers and fills in what those question marks are through the course of the briefing, into a briefing called the conceptual spiral. These works form the basis of a discourse on winning and losing, sort of Boyd's magnum opus, if you will. Revelation, at the very end, is not a briefing in principle that was delivered by Boyd, but rather a collection of material that postdates some, some of Boyd's principal deliveries of his presentations, but predates his final form of the OODA loop concept that so many people are interested in, which appears in a text called The Essence of Winning and Losing. All right, so this whole Boyd project is, what's it about? It's all about relativity. This M.C. Escher painting is one that I think sums up so much of what Boyd 
is trying to deal with. And that is the notion of shifting perspectives, shifting understandings. Most importantly, a term that is going to become central to everything that we talk about, shifting orientation. Orientation is how we view the world. It is the set of filters that we use to view the world. It is not simply our focus on a particular challenge, which is important in the tactical environment. But if we want to understand Boyd more broadly, we have to understand that orientation is ultimately about making sense of this of understanding where we are at any given time in relation to the world around us. A world of decision makers, a world of agents, a world of active individuals and systems that we need to understand, be able to comprehend, predict what they will do, make decisions about. The maze that is formed by orientation helps us also untangle the maze of the universe and the world around us. This is a very important point. Note bene, note well. You will see this again. Which brings us to the OODA loop. The conceptual scheme that Boyd crystallized finally only two years before his death in the form that we have in a conceptual scheme, a format, to explain how we observe, orient, decide, and act as agents in the world, as active agents in the world. This graphic is one that we will come back to in time. However, it's important to remember that this graphic is a model. And as George Box said, all models are wrong. I love this model, and yet it is an incomplete one. It is not correct in that it is not complete. However, just because all models are wrong doesn't mean some of them aren't useful. The OODA loop as a model is incredibly useful, particularly, I find, when we begin to dig into understanding these filters, the filters of orientation, and how they affect everything that goes on around us. This is ultimately where we are headed, is into orientation, picking it apart, trying to understand it. And I hope that I can take some of the last nearly 20 years of research and thinking and practice that I've done and offer it to you as a tool, a tool for learning, a tool for exploration. So I hope that is a great start for the week. Please, down in the comments, leave your thoughts on chapter one, the slash the introduction from the Ozinga text. It's pretty straightforward. There's not a lot really to discuss in this chapter. It is the introduction to an academic text, and we need to read it as such. Once we understand it as the introduction to an academic text, it can help inform how we will look at the rest of Ozinga's book as we explore it. Thank you so much for participating in this project, for participating and supporting us through Patreon. Please encourage other people that you think would benefit from this work to join in. Once we are about six months out from the initial release of these videos in any given cycle, I plan to post them for free to YouTube. So you as Patreon supporters are enabling me to create this work, but you're also enabling me to then distribute it more widely in time. I'm not planning on doing the same depth of um, focus on answering questions and offering feedback that I will be for the Patreon supporters. All of the members here are going to receive much more attention from me than the general public will. But about six months from now, we will start to see these videos appear on the Fire Service Warrior YouTube channel so that a wider audience can benefit from them. Again, I thank you for your support. I thank you for joining me on this project. I can't wait to see where we go with this. It's 
a very exciting time for me. And I'm glad to share it with you. I'll see you soon. Cheers.